Hello ladies, welcome to Homemakers Radio. I hope you can use this video to help make your day somewhat productive and special and accomplished. And what I mean by accomplished is not that you have to do great things, but that you to accomplish the peace that you need to comp accomplish the feeling of well-being that you need by having a home that reflects your personality and reflects uh, the Lord in your life. And if you would like to leave a comment, you have to go over to my blog for which I have left a link. And because I don't have anything over here on YouTube, and you will find that you can listen to this in a, a much on a much prettier page and without so many distractions. And if you would like to leave a comment, but you really don't want to leave one uh, through, uh, through Google, you can email me or you can just email me privately. If you want me to publish it, I will. Now, ladies, I usually spend some time talking. Uh, you can work while you listen. And I usually spend some time talking about getting ready. And uh, But before you get ready uh, and get going, I want to share my teacup with you. I've shown this to you before. It's a... I'm trying to think what that's called. I'll just show it to you. I know what it's called. Uh, sweet pea. Sweet pea, we call it. I don't know, maybe something else. And this is an antique. And I, the way I can tell the antiques is the handles are very, very small. You can't really... You have to hold them like this. And uh, there are other marks on them that indicate that they're very old. This is a clearance China made in England, and it was given to me by someone, and so I kept it. But I like the fact that there's a little bit on the inside that's quite amusing. Now, I also am going to read to you a little bit today, but it depends on whether I can get through my notes. And so I want to talk about appearance because when you uh, laze around all day in in your pajamas, you're just giving your mind, and in your slippers, you're just giving your mind the idea that you are not going to accomplish. It is uh, profoundly different to get dressed. And most of the books that I've read on uh, having your own home business or being self-employed always have a section in them, and, and they're written to men, about the importance of dressing up even if all you do all day is use the phone and no one sees you because you do speak differently when you're dressed up. And I dressed up as the best I could for you today. I uh, My plans today are to, Lord willing, I'm going to sweep and uh, going to move some things around and uh, go through some things. And I'm finally getting some control over my home. But I find that getting dressed is, you, you might think, well, you don't see anybody all day. You know, as being a homemaker, it's kind of isolating. And you may think it since you're not seeing anyone all day, you shouldn't get dressed. But I believe that there's such a difference, and you need to probably test it out for yourself. One day, get all dressed up, and even though you're not going to be seeing anyone outside of the home, get all dressed up and see what your, what your mood level is, what your performance is, and how the day went for you, how, how life went for you. And another day, uh, don't care. Now, that's not to say that women who um, go to the trouble to dress up are, aren't going to have any problems. This has happened to the best of people. That uh, that, But if you're dressed up, there's a dignity. You have a dignity that you, you might lack if you don't dress up. And if there is a problem, you do approach it a little bit differently if you're dressed up. Um, now, I know that there's been an attitude over the last goodness, since the 1970s, 70s, I noticed it, uh, early 1970s, maybe late 60s, I noticed this attitude against do, looking your best, against trying to dress up. And, and uh, the attitude was that, well, you're just trying to impress people, and we don't do that because that's just pride. But that wasn't the reason. Uh, I can remember back in the 50s people dressing up, but they weren't trying to impress anyone. They enjoyed being human. They enjoyed the dignity it gave them. They enjoyed the feeling that it gave them. And I remember clothing that was made in the USA with really good materials and how nice they made you. You felt like a new person if you bought a new outfit. And they didn't have things like polyester in it or any kind of um, uh, what I would say man-made artificial materials in it. And it was things like we had wonderful cotton here and the cotton was in different grades and um, 
the, just a feeling of that crisp freshness wearing some of the uh, some of the clothes. <clears throat> and hopefully we can get back to that. <clears throat> but in the meantime, you can have a freshly pressed blouse or dress and a skirt and an apron over that and feel just fine. Now I have a friend who uh, is very, very young and she's not yet married, but she likes to keep house for her family. She has, she's in a large family and she likes to, when it's her turn, you know, to do some certain job, she likes to put on a, a maid's apron and, and think of herself, uh, think of her, uh, her ancestors, uh, cleaning and maybe earning money by, uh, by being a maid. And she says it just gives her a different feeling and it motivates her. And, uh, I like the idea that some of these young people have got, such a great uh, scope for the imagination, as Anne would say in Anne of Green Gables. And so I left the world um, on January the, not January, July, July the 4th or July the 7th. I'd have to look back and see what date that was that I decided not to go anywhere anymore. I just decided the frustration of trying to get catch up on so many things in my house that have bothered me for years. A bookshelf that never got cleaned, uh, boxes that never went, I never went through, and sorting through stuff, uh, you know, just examining everything that I have to see whether uh, it would be strong enough to last and keep, and what needed to go, and what needed to stay, and then I wanted to paint my walls, and I, there are all kinds of things I want to do. All the sewing I wanted to do that I never could get around to, and I started to time the amount of uh, trips and things I had to do away from the home and I would uh, write down the time, the time that it took me from getting ready to go to coming home. And then of course having to wind down several hours from being out. And these were necessary trips, they weren't for pleasure, they were just you know, going out to uh, get supplies, going out to pay bills, going out to do whatever I needed to do. Um, and see people too that I, I was obligated to visit and I decided that uh, with this um, with the social situation and the and the health situation and the political situation after seeing uh, such tension in town in the last couple of places that I went that I used to enjoy going to and I saw you know, people being treated badly, and I also saw people being upset, and I thought, well, you know, I think I'll just stay out of it. I'll just stay home, and um, that way I can get something done, and I have really enjoyed it, and ladies, if you're one of the ones that send me things on um, uh, contributions on PayPal, that is extremely helpful because I can order what I need, and I don't have to go out and get it, and uh, I just found that writing down the time that it took me to do something really helped convince me to stay home. So I have not been off. Of course, I'm out on a farm, so it's not like being uh, in a tiny little uh, dorm room or apartment. And I do go out and and uh, have a lot to do besides in the house. The house is small, so I suppose if I were cooped up here for a long time and couldn't leave, that might be different. But I have been really, really enjoying it. And I have joined... Uh, I have thought about uh, a lot of classes to join and realized I couldn't uh, continue doing that because it does interfere a lot with uh, the house and the housekeeping and my other goals. But I did keep two classes and one was the exercise class and the other was the art class. And I wanted to just show you one of the art, art pieces that I did in the art class that I'm taking. And before you go around thinking that I'm some brilliant artist, the lady that does the art, uh, that teaches the class, sends us the uh, drawing that we can print off and uh, then she helps us with uh, the shading and the different brushes and and the different effects of it so I'm, I'm really enjoying that and then the exercises have done more for me than I even expected um, made me have a little bit more stamina strength and longevity as far as uh, sticking to something and also cleared my mind a little bit. I know, you know, running a lot and going out a lot, and I homeschooled my kids, and we were always uh, taking advantages of, of cultural things that were happening. If there was a band playing in a park, we would all go. And uh, But this staying home has cleared my thinking so that I don't have so much competition. 
of what I just saw out there and where I'm going and where I'm parking. I don't have so much mental competition. I can focus better and I can focus better on my home and I'm really, really enjoying it. And I have always liked, I'm always attracted to the videos on YouTube of people who have, who are spending a year uh, somewhere uh, and doing something special like writing a book or be, uh, painting and they're just going to pull themselves away for a while from the world. And, you know, people used to do that in the in the Victorian days. They had holidays they took where they just went somewhere near nature and just stayed away from all the commotion. And um, so I've been staying away from the commotion. It's been five months, and I'm really um, not wanting, I'm not missing it, not missing it a bit, not missing any of the, uh, uh, the noise. There's a lot of noise, you know, inside of the commercial areas, a lot of noise, a lot of music. Um, we used to call it noisic when I was a kid. I'm not missing it a bit, and it's a perfect time to to do this because people automatically cons uh, assume that I'm just staying away from from society and from people because of the the health situation, and so I'm just going to take advantage of it and do that. Now, to keep from feeling isolated, now in ordinary times, in any times, homemakers have always not only uh, been isolated, but they've been sidelined by other people who don't want anything to do with them because they're not out in the world working and they somehow feel there's something wrong with them. Uh, I even knew homemakers who, whose uh, friends had suggested they go see a psychiatrist because they wanted to stay home. <laughs> but you know, there's been a lot of prejudice about that over the decades. And I think with this situation, and so many women staying home now, they're not going to be mocking it quite so much. And so that's a that's a good thing. And uh, also people who are homeschooling their children aren't going to get the backlash that some of us got back in the 1980s when we were threatened and uh, we were terrorized by the truancy officers and the schools and 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 friends just wouldn't look at us anymore. And uh, so that's that's not going to be so hard for people anymore because everybody had to do it, even the ones that didn't believe in it and didn't like it. Uh, so that I think that's kind of interesting how, you know, the Bible says all things work together for good for them that love God. And uh, somehow it's going to work together uh, for our good. Uh, some of these people have had to experience staying home, having a home business, being a homemaker, and I hope you're working now and getting something done and not sitting here watching because I don't really have anything for you to, to look at. So all things are working together for our good in some way, I think. Now, to keep from feeling isolated, I think it's good to make a routine, uh, starting with a list, and then make a schedule, and then make appointments. Now, a routine is not the same as any of this. A routine is something that you observe, you kind of fall into naturally when you wake up, what's the first thing you do, and then what do you do after that, and it becomes your routine. And uh, then a list is all the things you have to do that are most urgent, and all the things you want to do. And then after that, there's a schedule. That's where you schedule in uh, to be a certain time. I don't keep a schedule unless there's something coming up that happens at that hour. But a schedule is where you follow uh, an hourly time, you know, from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock to do such and such. I've, I've never been successful at it, so that when I schedule something, it's when there's a class coming up, like my art class. And I will schedule that because I have to go to that. It has to be at that time. And then uh, appointments. Now, one thing you can do to keep from feeling this uh, a sense of being alone and being isolated, maybe being even uh, ignored by the world by everybody by your friends and uh, is to make appointments with yourself within the house you know or within your within your realm make appointments and I was thinking the other day you know I'd like to do something interesting I've always wanted things I've always wanted to do I'm thinking I'm going to try and do them like for instance I always wanted to paint more and so I joined an art class and the reason I hadn't before is you had to go somewhere. It was usually in the evening. Uh, it was inconvenient. And if you had children, you had to take them with you, and they didn't welcome them very much. And uh, you, it, it just was so disturbing that I just gave up 
you know, trying to take all these types of classes. Well, now we're in the internet era and it has been so convenient for me. And uh, so the Zoom classes have been just great. And I wanted to do some things. So I made a list one time and, you know, you should have your master list and it should be, you should have a notebook that kind of looks like this where you have uh, sections in it. And, and like this is my this is my list of daily things I must do. I can just throw that away uh, because I even put things like on there like get up, <laughs> get up, brush teeth, <laughs> and uh, so if I had a page on here of of dreams of things that I wanted to do, and whether I could do it or not, whether it was reality or not, the things I really wanted to do. And one of the things I've always wanted to do is walk the Oregon Trail. And uh, so I decided, uh, my daughter had made me an Oregon Trail costume years ago, and my granddaughter had years later made me uh, a bonnet, uh, the schooner, schooner hat that the women wore, you know, that had the little flap in the back to keep your neck uh, from getting the sun on it. And so I had planned, so what I have planned is to live a day on the Oregon Trail, and I'm going to dress like that, and I'm going to try to have food like that, and then I'm going to walk over there to the uh, meeting house, the church building, which was built around that time. And um, there are, I'm going to have a schedule and, and try to uh, experience this Oregon Trail Day. And I might even have some friends over to do it with me, too. And maybe we will have tea together. And uh, so these are just some things and other things that I have wanted to do, like finish sewing my fabric and making it into... Uh, costume uh, inspired or history inspired painting inspired clothing that you could wear today but have the kind of the look and some of the elements of the uh, clothing that I admire from the 1800s so in other words the the dresses wouldn't be as wide or as long uh, and the they wouldn't have so many embellishments on but would have somewhat the shape and somewhat the the feeling of it and so I wrote that down too and I was able to make a couple of them this year and being um, being able to stay home is what has helped me to achieve some of that so I'm going to see how long I'll last so far I don't miss anything I don't want to go out there there's nothing in, in there that and I've had company I've had a lot of company uh, I had some ladies drop by the other day um, impromptu for tea and they brought just nearly everything all they wanted was for me to heat the water they brought their tea bags they brought everything they were on their way somewhere else and I am in between their house and this other place so they wanted to stop by for tea and actually they brought the tea so I have had quite a bit of company and I'm not feeling and you know with the uh, with the texting and the phone and and the videos that I watch I don't feel as isolated as I would have expected from staying home. So make a routine, make a list and a schedule and give yourself some appointments. Now the way to give, I give myself an appointment because I say I have an appointment today to exercise so I'm going to go back to my exercise room. It's just a space in one of the rooms and that is what I do while I'm while I'm there. Now one of the things I noticed about the exercises as opposed to the uh, art classes, now the art classes are very focused you watch the teacher and you listen to the instructions and then you do what you can uh, but you can't be you can't get distracted at all because it's so focused but with exercises if I'm in a room and I'm exercising I'm looking around and I'm thinking oh I need to paint that wall over there oh I think I should take those curtains down and wash them <laughs> and I just and I can get very distracted or there's something out of place over there and I'll go and move something and, and then I don't get my exercises done but uh, this is very, very, uh, it is still effective to make yourself some appointments. Like I will make myself an appointment when I talk about accomplishing something, when I talk about achieving something. I'm not talking about inventing something and um, writing a book or being somehow famous in the world. I'm talking about accomplishing something. And one of my appointments is to sit down and go through uh, the month's the month's magazines that that I have or you know I get out my old ones I go if it's November I'll get out some of my November old Victoria's or old something else and 
So I'll sit down, I'll make an appointment to sit there for a while and just go through those magazines, refresh myself a little bit. So anything that I've always wanted to do, I started doing it once I started staying home. And I think a lot of women um, are very frustrated at the fact that they want to stay home and they are home basically, but they are um, saddled down with a lot of uh, things they have to go do while their husbands are at work. They are they are the family managers. They're the money managers. They have to go do everything, and they have to uh, they have to go and get things. And so, but I have managed uh, to order as much as I need, and so that's been very handy. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, the home and cleaning it and taking care of it. It's more than cleaning, of course. We all know that, but it's also making it an arrangement that that lifts your heart. And I get a lot of my ideas from uh, Pinterest and from books and magazines. But in the end, you still have to stand back and look at it and make sure it's something you like looking at. Uh, it, the pictures don't always work out in real life. I can see a picture in a magazine and think, oh, I really like that. I think I'll put this here and this here. It won't look any good in my house. Uh, so it comes to down to experimenting, shifting things around. Uh, putting things and standing back. Don't you remember in the olden days when we used to hang a picture and um, we'd hang it up and then we'd stand way back to look to make sure it was even or make sure we liked it and then we'd get back up and readjust it and that's all it is is you're just adjusting things to how you how your eyes take it in and uh, how it's arranged has a lot to do with how you're going to feel about your house and I noticed that the ladies that had come for tea the other day I said, uh, I hadn't seen them in a couple of years, actually, and I said, you haven't been here in a while. Why don't you just take a tour of the house? Because I had changed so many things, and uh, so I just let them loose, and they just kind of wandered through, and they said it was like going somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, they said you have everything uh, here that you would have if you went on a holiday, and that's why I'm telling you, ladies, sometimes spend a lot of money on a holiday, but why don't you buy yourself some nice fresh new bedding and bath towels and make it luxurious for you at home or something new for the kitchen and and make it nice for you at home. One of the things I did for my kitchen was I took a Zoom course in cooking and I it was one particular dish and they sent you the uh, you had to pay but they sent you the on email the list of ingredients you would need and all the things you needed to prepare the pans you needed to use and then everybody that comes to the class got on Zoom and uh, you were instructed, I'll just kind of like an art class. And that's just one treat that I had for my kitchen was I wanted to find out how to cook something differently that I hadn't done before. I want to stretch a little bit beyond and that has just really been helpful. So I want to go now into talking about the way we talk, the way we speak. I talked to you last time, or I lectured you last time, about how we crush people and how we don't build them up by because we're negative, what we say. And I, I don't like to use the word negative. It sounds too 60-ish, but I don't have anything better to say. But you, you can crush people's spirits by the way you say something. And I mentioned that uh, sometimes uh, someone will be real enthusiastic about something and someone else will feel very obligated to say, yes, but you know... Uh, that that wasn't that way or that wasn't a good idea or something like that and just crush their just crush their ideal or or they might be even expressing an ambition they have or a dream and it's never very smart to crush somebody's dream that's between them and god just leave them alone <laughs> now of course when you're raising children you want to guide them into uh, wholesome dreams and uh, things that they can accomplish and uh, but also keep the idea that you can achieve something and that you you can think of something to to do that sounds rather impossible to some people but might be possible and um, I think that's very important to be an encourager Christian women especially need to be careful to have wholesome speech now I was I've been trying to read this article that I printed off that was my own from my sidebar called refined speech for Christian women and it talks about how women would, uh, in the church especially, would never dream of cursing or swearing or using foul language. 
but in many ways they do when they crush people's spirits, it just pours cold water on, on everything. They also have sometimes a way of speaking that is, it is so strange, it's twisting scripture. And the way they do it, uh, I'm not saying they, I'm just saying this, this, is, this happens, you know, uh, is they will say, uh, well, uh, we are all, uh, we are all doing pretty well, but things are going to get worse. And then they will remind you that the Bible says evil men will wax worse and worse. And what a way, you know, I was being a young person and having had young children too, I was always very careful and aware that I didn't want to dash their hopes of the future by saying, you know, kids, evil men will wax worse and worse, so you better be prepared. It's a terrible world. That's not very smart to, to raise kids by, and nobody likes to listen to it. So if... Uh, we also need to know that, yes, of course, you know, I told you before that when the state gets through with us and they see we survive, they'll think of something else. But I look at it more with amusement because it challenges me uh, to, I use, I use those kind of things, those kind of attacks as um, an excuse to leap, do leaps and bounds ahead of my own boundaries, ahead of my own um my own plans and reach a little further and, and develop more skills. Well, I'll just say to myself, oh, they're going to, uh, they're going to shut us down again. Well, I'm going to learn to play the piano this time. <laughs> that reminds me of a joke. Somebody told me once, went to see their dentist and asked the dentist, um, doctor, when you get finished uh, with this tooth surgery, will I, will I be able to play the piano? And he said, yes, I don't see any reason why not. And the young man said, well, that's good because I didn't know how in the first place. But anyway, to, uh, to go back to how you use adversity, adversity is just, uh, to me, it's a magnet to success. It's a magnet to, it's, it's a jumping off place for me to go and do something else. So when this adversity came, came along, which a lot of people were, they suffered from it, and I, and I have great sympathy for that. I decided that I wasn't going to let it, I'm not going to wait it out. I'll never wait out something. Uh, like we had all that smoke, you know, so I didn't wait it out. I just sat there and made things. And uh, there was a lady that went with her husband to a logging area out here in Oregon. And it was during the summer and he was going to be gone quite a while. And so she, they took their travel trailer with them. And she didn't just sit there, wait for him all day to come home. She made quilts. Well, she, she said she had never sewn in her life, but she got a little quilting book magazine. And she sat there and she made the most beautiful quilt I have ever seen. I don't know what happened to it, but I always wanted to ask her if I could have it. And I was too shy to ask. And she passed away and I don't know what happened to it. Um, but she didn't wait. She didn't wait anything out. I'm not one to wait for something. I want to... Um, I remember when we were children, we used to look out the front window waiting for our dad to come home, and it just seemed like an eternity. And uh, in a way, it's like waiting for Christ to return. He wants us, and spelled out specifically by his own words, that he wants us to be found busy, you know, busy in the field or, you know, people busy in their homes uh, want, want us to be found working when he comes again. So I'm not going to wait for the government to straighten out because I'm going to get my house fixed up. I'm going to get it the way that I like it, and they will think of something more to torture us with, and so we'll get into that later. Um, so we need to be careful to, you know, people would tell us, you need to be careful to build up the brethren, and I would always say, well, what about the cistern? <laughs> you know, the brothers and the sisters, we need to be careful to build one another up and not dash their hopes, and I can remember being somewhere once when uh, the uh, women that I was around were so negative that the young people were, the young women were saying, well, when I grow up, I want to do this or I want to do that. Or maybe they would describe the kind of house and furniture they'd like to have. And these women were just terrible. They were constantly saying, well, you don't know you can have that. Well, you, you shouldn't be even th thinking about that because you might not be able to get it. That's the trouble with this kind of thinking is that the fact that you might not achieve something uh, they think means you shouldn't even be thinking about it. But only a person who leaves a dry uh, life would not have, it's healthy. It's healthy to have plans and dreams 
even if they don't work out. I have a lot of them, and I work at them, I chip at them a little bit at a time, and I think to myself, well, maybe it won't work out, maybe I won't achieve it, but I'm doing it, and that's a healthy way to live, but to, to sit around waiting because you don't have any talents or you don't want to fail means you will never achieve anything, but I believe that adversity is a great, um, it's a great tool in some ways. You can uh, you can use it to climb up on something and, and get something done. Um, and I'm just speaking of that metaphorically. So just use it as a signal to achieve. And when you get dressed up for your home, you're signaling to your brain that something is happening or something is going to happen. Have you ever got all dressed up or dressed your children up and they said, are we going somewhere or where are we going? Well, that's how you should feel when you get dressed up for your home, that you're going somewhere. And, uh, and yes, we are going somewhere. We're going uh, into the living room to clean that up. We're going into the dining room to eat, to dine. Uh, we are going uh, into the bedrooms to clean those up and make them nice. And every room is a place. You know, like, get ready for bed at night. In the olden days, we used to have a routine. It was a kind of almost a ceremony where we would go and pull all the curtains closed and... Um, you know, turn the fire down and turn the oil lamps down and kind of walk through the house, make sure the door's bolted and to, uh, and then turn the beds down and put the, the warmers. We had hot water bottles that we would put inside of the beds to keep, to warm them up while the children were taking baths. So when they got into bed, the sheets wouldn't be cold. And we had a, we kind of had kind of a routine. And so it was like going somewhere. And I think that's the way you can feel in your own home. Now, I don't know quite know where to start with some of this, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about politics because it affects the women at home. And when it starts affecting our the way we uh, the way we cook, the way we clean, and our sense of well-being, then of course we you we need to be aware of what's going on. One reason is. If they cut off your food, you're going to have a hard time filling up your pantry. If they cut off your, uh, they cut off essentials in your life, then that affects you, and that's you. Sh that should perk you up as to what is going on. And what is going on is for the last few years, um, we have been trying to throw off um, the anti-God oppressors that uh, scrunch down on our lives and won't let us have the freedom to choose the schools we go to. Or, uh, or the um, the way we live, and also they are the same people that uh, want to tax us so highly that, and and they live off our taxes and support their evil deeds off of that. We're trying to throw th this sort of thing off, and I will leave you some links so you can listen to it. I don't think it's very helpful to listen to network news, because even some of the conservative news is gone off. They're very, very depressing. And uh, But some of the citizen journalists that I've been leaving links for, they're not paid. They, they just live off of your donations and they don't have anything to gain by, um, um, by, by quoting a certain narrative. They, they uh, research everything themselves. So I'll leave you some links to them. They're quite encouraging. So we're trying to throw off um, throw off the communists. And I was listening to a lady on YouTube talk about being growing, growing up in a communist country. And this is something I've read to you out of A. Becca, um, Old World History and Geography and New, New World History and Geography, which we used in homeschooling, where it would put side by side what communism uh, taught and did and what, what a free country taught and did and why we must keep America free. And this lady that was being interviewed recently uh, had written a book about her life in, uh, in a communist country, and it went right along with what that A. Becca book had, had said, that, that instructional book for homeschoolers had said, and we need to be teaching our children to hate it, to hate communism, hate socialism, and hate globalism, uh, because the world doesn't belong to these people. It belongs to Christians. It belongs to people who are going to use it the way God wants us to. And uh, 
we're not supposed to be controlled by these people. We're controlled by God. And so I was listening to this lady talk about the things that faced her. And the interview viewer asked her, well, why didn't the people just rise up? Why didn't they just rise up and throw off their government? She said, first of all, a communist government like she was living under kept them under so much uh, stress and made they were hungry. They, they reduced the amount of food they could get. They couldn't get goods and products. They couldn't find fuel for their, uh, to heat their homes. And so they were absorbed with surviving. So all they were thinking about is where can I get some more bread? Where can I, you know, how can I fill up my belly so it won't growl so much? So, of course, they're not going to have the uh, leisure of throwing off their government. And so you think, oh, well, you know, we uh, the shelves are empty and, and uh, well, we don't need to eat all that stuff anyway. But the thing is, when, when you start getting to the point where uh, this lady said when you're desperate, uh, you're not thinking about whether whether the government is causing it or not. In fact, you hope the government will help you. You hope they will start feeding you. And so you're not going to go against them because they might be the ones that you need. You know, they're controlling all the food. And so you think you can see an empty shelf in a store and you think, oh, well, that doesn't matter. But the thing is, we have to have these goods and products. They make us human. We don't have to be. She was talking about how they would be digging in the ground looking for any green thing to eat or anything to eat and what it brought them to. And so a people oppressed cannot serve the Lord as well as people who are free. And I've heard a lot of Christians, they get, they get so messed up. I, I've heard, and sometimes even preachers, uh, they start uh, quoting things without thinking about it. And they'll say, well, whatever happens, it's God's will. But that is not encouraging because it intimates that uh, if you let an oppressive government take over you, that's God's will. That may not be God's will. He wants his people to be able to preach the gospel. You can't preach the gospel when you're under an oppressive government. And he wants his people to spread his word and to have families and to, um, and to have churches. You can't do that if, uh, if you allow a communist government to take over. So you can't go around telling people, well, whatever happens, you know, it'll be God's will. The other thing that I don't like, I don't like the, I can't live under too much of this punishment stuff. Yes, I realize we will all reap the consequences of things we do. Like I see that in the home all the time, like maybe taking a little bit of extra time to, to, you know, stand around and stare and, and I lose time and then I'm late doing something. That's the consequences. But uh, to uh, for people that are hurting, for people that can't find what they need in the stores and people that are, that are not allowed to go beyond a certain mileage in their town or people that are just uh, uh, separated from their, their elderly parents because they're not allowed to see them, it's not good to tell them that God has punished them. That is not not the, not the right thing to say. And uh, that shows a lack of sympathy. And so that's just a bad thing to say. When I talk to women about the way they talk, I also want to mention that, uh, and I'm getting off the subject of, of politics, but I will go back to it. But I want to say that I don't have notes, so I, I have to say something before it flies out of my head. Um, <laughs> It makes itself wings and flies away. And that is, they need to have wholesome speech. The Bible, especially the New Testament, talks about wholesome speech. And women forget that. They get in a gathering of women or they get on a blog or they get on a message board or something and they just start talking about things that they should not talk about that are uh, private. And in this paper, I mentioned that some of them were things like your family finances, Things like uh, personal failings of members of the family. You don't need to do that. You don't need to go and uh, talk to your uh, friends and, and, and with other women aloud about things that are private. And uh, so I'll just read some of the things that I, I cringe when I see, especially Christian ladies doing this, or people who claim to be Christians and they have... They have blogs about Titus II or womanhood, and I think I know. Uh, I think you can probably find find which ones I'm talking about. Okay, so here it is. Uh, 
discerning women have to understand that it is possible to offend the purity of anyone of any age, whether married or not. The more a Christian lady strives for pure thinking and pure living, the more she would be aware of how speaking of things that are done in the dark, and that's mentioned in the Bible, talks about we ought not to speak of things that are done in the dark. That means personal things. Can harm the pure in heart, no matter what age they are. Uh, so, there are still some women who find it hard to discern what should and should not be spoken of aloud. And I think that it's the same as typing it on on a blog or uh, somewhere else on a on social media. I think it's just the same as talking it out loud. And to be careful to be wholesome and pure and not bring people's minds down to things that are personal so or fleshly. Avoid talk about personal bodily functions. Even discussing your digestive tract can be a problem when other ladies just want to have polite, cheerful, uplifting conversation. There are plenty of uh, Jane Austen references to people who, who were talking about their ailments, you know, and even in Emma. Uh, was it Emma's father that said, you know, if, if you eat that, you'll have a stomach ache or something. Um, keep some things private. Um, keep, speak not of things that create pictures in the mind of immodesty of any sort or any graphic dis description or anything to do with physical privacy. Conversations alluding to certain things can become embarrassing even if it's just about cleanliness. Uh, do not talk about the details of your family finances to anyone outside the family and be careful not to divulge such private things to to uh, people who might be using it against you. So you can't trust everybody. Uh, don't bring up past bad experiences and tell them in detail, uh, time after time. Um, avoid the bad conversation habit of one-upmanship, or I do it better, or I never do that. Uh, that is really, um, that's just a grating conversation. Um, Correcting everyone every time they speak, or their grammar, or the things they are saying. Always asking why or why is that in response to everything anyone says. Digging a little further, trying to get more information. Walking into a conversation between people and um, blurting out or just demanding to know what someone's talking about. Not discerning when you're not included in the conversation. Um, Silly talking that has no point. Doting about words and strifes. 1 Timothy 6.4 Great swelling words of vanity. 2 Peter 2.18 Hasty, sharp responses. And um, so then, then it's easy to get it back into control if uh, you can change the subject or if you can gently guide someone away from talk like that. But I've recently seen Christian women who claim to be Titus II women who talk about things that should not be talked about in a, on a public blog where where people who don't have pure minds can read it and and um, use it for bad purposes. I think that's very very bad. You can't you can't do that and be edifying to other people. Now I want to talk a little bit more about about the uh, political situation and reassure you. That if you will look up some of these links that I provide, I'm not going to repeat everything they have said about the current uh, political situation, but I will say it's not um, as distressing as the um, news media, and uh, it's more edifying. So I will try to uh, include as many as I can there. So let me tell you what all they've they've done to us that. But I will tell you the good side, too. Okay, they put us under house arrest, these governors. That's, I told you last time you can discover who the Marxists are and who these people that are in the globalist system, the global government, who are getting millions of dollars uh, off of us to live high. And, uh, and then they uh, use the government to put us under house arrest. They took away our freedom to see our loved ones. Many people didn't even get to be with their uh, parents or grandparents when they died. Um, our, uh, they took away our freedom to travel, so we can't, you know, people can't go see their kids or their grandkids. 
they um, took away our churches. I don't know what they're going to do with all these empty church buildings, but uh, even those who were meeting at home were told they weren't even allowed to gather at home. So they took away our ability to worship together. And, uh, and Zoom just doesn't do it the same way. And they took away our, um, they burned our cities. And then they took away our identity and took away our breath. And uh, I think I know what, I think you know what I'm talking about. And um, that's not safety, kids. That's tyrant. That's ty ty tyranny. So mark those governors and mark those lawyers and judges and mayors and mark those stores that do that. You know, the most communism I ever saw was in the public school and also in the stores. Um, the public schools operate like a communist country and so do the, uh, you get used to, you get the kids used to a certain way of life every day and uh, they think that's pretty normal. Then when the government scrunches down and does the same thing and every, everything, they think that's pretty normal. But um, the stores were very, very communistic and um, Marxist. You walk in and they order the customers around as though they were cattle and didn't have any, there was no, the humanness was gone. And a lot of reasons that people enjoyed shopping was that uh, they knew the proprietor and they uh, would go in and, and say hello and have conversation. And instead, now they were being watched, um, watched and uh, constantly monitored. Um, so I decided, well, I wanted to just not participate in that system, so I'm staying home. My house is, there's freedom in my house, there's creativity in my house, and there's love, and there's care of other people. But I can, we can beat that, all that, by living fully, by develop, using the opportunity to develop your talents and your intellect, and your strength, and your, um, your physical strength. Maybe you could improve maybe you can prove your health a little bit. And I know people who are who are cooking more and uh, learning more about things because they're home. You know, the Bible talks uh, has a verse that says, in him we live and breathe and have our being. But you know that it's a wicked oppressor that tries to take away your breath and your life. And uh, I think I you know what I mean by that. They also talks about people who can take away your soul in a way they can destroy your soul it's one thing to destroy the body but what they take away your soul your ability um, to diminish your faith in God and to diminish your your ability to pray and just uh, this woman that had grown up in communism was telling about how hard it was because um, the punishment was so severe for praying to God or for expressing your personal faith that it discouraged most people from doing it. Um, but always remember that uh, anything that's worth anything that's worth doing is going to have a big backlash against it. So I found that when I was homeschooling and also being a homemaker, decided to stay home and be a homemaker. I just couldn't believe there was so much uh, animosity towards it. No one, I'd never heard it before. But of course, when you're not taking a stand, you're not going to see it. Uh, but then I decided, you know, after a brief, after a brief moment of being crushed, that I was not going to uh, stay down there and be crushed. I was going to use it as an opportunity for something else. So today, I would like to read to you out of this book called Just Breathing the Air that I wrote and. I don't want you to buy it yet because the uh, the publisher got the wrong price on it. And so I'm going to try to get that straightened out. And then I'm going to order some and maybe send some to some. I know I've only got about 20 listeners so I can afford you. And I might be able to send some to you. Um, I always thought that having a Bible class for ladies class, I thought, oh, I just want this big Bible class and all these women will come. But when it... It didn't happen that way because I live in farm country and of course people travel quite a ways away and we just have a small group. They fit in my living room and they come once a week, but I can afford them. Now I can afford to make them something nice to eat that is is um, high quality. Or if, if it comes around to maybe autumn, we like to kind of give each other gifts now and then. I can make make gifts without any, without any expense. So since there's only a few of you here, 
I might just get you each one of these once I get this price straightened out. So this is the story of um, of a family on a homestead in Alaska, and it's my mother and father that it mainly was about. Uh, so I want to read the review that I got on the back from my aunt, my father's sister. She's my oldest living relative, and she is in her... Goodness, she must be 90 by now. I don't know. I uh, can't remember what year she was born. In Just Breathing the Air, Lydia Sherman has given the reader a glimpse of an incredible childhood few, even in her generation, could ever imagine, and few in, in an older generation would have had the courage to provide. Would have had the courage to provide. You know, there's always... There's always somebody that tells you you can't you can't do that. That's not good for the kids. You should bring them up in this uh, in this uh, place that has a lot of comforts and a lot of wealth and a lot of richness. You don't want to put your children through that. But she says few parents would have had the courage to provide to their children. In doing so, she subtly paints a beautiful portrait of her remarkable parents. The book would be a delightful read for old and young alike, but especially for young people growing up in this age of, of electronic everything, fast food, and loosely connected families. Okay, so then my mother wrote, Our daughter, Lydia, relates her memories of the homestead in Alaska in a way that makes the reader feel they really are drawn in. So I'm going to start uh, reading this. And I'll tell you, if you want to write a book, and you have memories, but you don't know where to start. The way I started this was the first picture that comes to my mind when I think of my childhood up there. That was the point at which I wanted to start. And the picture that always came to me was all of us children, all we called us us children. I know that's not correct grammar, but that's the way we spoke. Us kids. And, uh, and the lake. That was the, the lake was the focus. It was we had picture windows in the house my father built, and the lake was the focus. And we spent a lot of time running up and down that hill. We had running water. We ran up and down the hill with buckets of water <laughs> before we got um, the pump and plumbing. Anyway, I have mentioned to you the movie Magic of Ordinary Days, uh, the Hallmark movie The Magic of Ordinary Days, and and you can. I could probably find a link for you that somewhere you can watch it. Somebody might have put it on YouTube. But I thought my mother and father, when I saw this movie, I thought, oh, they, they, they're they similar in looks to my mother and father because the movie took place apparently in the 1940s. And my mother and father went to Alaska in, the, in 1948, I think it was. And this is them in 1948 before they had any children. And... Um, I thought she looked a lot like Livy in the book, in the in the movie. And I'll only take away the Livy's black hair and put the redhead because my mother was a redhead. In fact, she had very orange um, light. She was like a strawberry blonde with orangish-looking skin, and uh, she you know she always liked those colors, and she liked amber and glass glasses that were amber. They're kind of a uh, yellowish gold brownish color. She always liked it, liked the way the sun came through in amber glass. And she liked anything that color. She liked the fire in the fireplace and she liked the sun um, the, when it was golden. And so my mother to me is a sunny, happy person, but she did have um, the red head look. And that was what my father always admired uh, about her was that that flaming red hair and her light skin and um, and he was the opposite you know he had the uh, the Elvis Presley look with the with the dark hair and he was from Texas she was from Canada he was from Texas but both of those you know in doing our um, genealogy years ago before DNA um, people had discovered that their families had uh, intermarried way back in the 1800s and so uh, Nova Scotia was the place where many people where many people met apparently so so I'm going to start out with the first uh, I have pictures of them here my mother uh, in um, High Prairie Alberta Canada with her friends and my father and 
so my mother, she wrote this to me. Because I was always asking them why they, you know, how they met and what they did. And when I, when I was a teenager, the one thing that I wanted to do the most was reenact their life. You know, we talk about reenacting um, pioneer stories, and and there's always the Victorian reenactments. And I spent reenactment days, you know, where uh, we would dress in costume and go have a whole day, a pioneer day on someone's farm. The homeschoolers used to like to do that, and we've done a lot of them. Um, but the one thing I always wanted to do is reenact my mother and father's life. And I, so when I was, um, when I was 20 or 19, I went to um, White Horse City, Yukon Territory, on my own uh, and visited that town. And then I went to Anchorage, Alaska, where they had got, or where they had lived, and uh, then went back to the homestead to look at that, um, where we had grown up. So I always wanted to do that route, and I, I was able to uh, live that dream when I was, I believe I was 19 when I did that. And I I would never, uh, it was back in the 1960s, and I would never do it, um, I never allow my children to do it because of all the dangers that I ran into. I would not recommend it, but I just wanted to tell you that's what I did. It doesn't mean that I um, advise it. Okay, so my mother said, I was married to an adventurous man, and I didn't know any better, so I followed him. I wondered how we expected to cope in all the rough situations with three small children, but we did not give that, it that much thought. This was after they had um, arrived, after they had uh, been married a few years. Both of us were from pioneer stock. Joe recalls the hard times, and by the way, in those days, every other man was, married, was named Joe. <laughs> If you walked into a room and said, Joe, they'd all turn around. All these men would turn around. It was a, such a well-loved name. Joe recalls hard times in Texas, and I was brought up in the cold climate of Alberta, Canada, where my parents homesteaded, so we were game for anything. Now, I had a picture once, but I don't anymore. Some of my cousins in Canada probably have it, a uh, copy of it. Uh, my mother's father built them a house on the back of a wagon, uh, and they it was the first gypsy wagon, I guess, but uh, they lived, that was their house. They just moved around, and I don't know if it was driven by a truck or, or what. And so the first thing that I remembered is where I decided I'm going to start with it. I'm going to start with this book with my first memory and somehow bring it to life. My first memory, I won't even read it to you because there's a backstory to every one of these pages. And um, so the first memory I have is uh, running a uh, mother ringing the dinner bell. She had a, a bell because she couldn't just go out and yell all the time. So she rang this dinner bell. And of course, we were always hungry. Everybody in those days was so thin, and uh, we ran. We were always at the lake, and we ran up the hill for dinner. And um, I remember her calling all of our names. And when I went to visit again, visit the homestead and the lake, I could actually thought that I heard her, because <laughs> she'd done it so many times. It just kept ringing in my ears. So here it is. Um, People that have gone to that place have said they had a sense that something had taken place there. Something had happened there. So, perhaps these people sense that something special happened here, as in the story you are about to read. Since those days have passed, I have had many dreams of our daily life as real as though it just happened. I can still see the little Kathy tied up to the dock. That was the name of the little uh, dinghy or skiff my father built for my mother. I can still hear the axe splitting the firewood. I can still see my father's amused face in its one-sided smile. Do you remember in the old days when the men used to smile on one side of their face? <laughs> that was an American thing, wasn't it? Or maybe it was a southern thing. Uh, <clears throat> And hear my mother's laughter trickling like a stream. Everyone that knew her thought she had the most beautiful, unique laugh. I never quite could uh, get it that way for myself. She is calling us home. Lydia, Mike, Kathy, Johnny, Paul, Bobby, Mark, supper time. 
We run down the steep incline to the lake. We walk the home road, chattering. Our happy, carefree childhood was made sweeter by parents who guarded their seven children while sharing their amazing adventure. It just happened yesterday. Mama said in her childhood that it was like one long golden summer. and She made sure ours was too. So ladies, I've already spoken for an hour, but I'll show you this is a uh, the land patent document. Uh, I don't know if that's the same thing as a deed. Um, but she talks, well, I'll, t I'll just read you one more page about this document, um, how they got the land patent here. Uh, and this is actually a photograph of the real one. Uh, which I own. So she she said, my mother said, we took up a homestead of 160 acres on the Kenai Peninsula near Island Lake. The first thing we did was go off to the land office where they showed us the area we could homestead and gave us maps. We had to go on the land and step it out to locate the proper markers. We did this in September 1953. Now I want to insert here that they did have to pay a fee. They did pay for the land. It wasn't free. Uh, completely free by the time you uh, paid all the fees and things like that. A light snow had fallen and the weather was mild. We tramped through the snow with compass and tape and when we had gone around what was to be our homestead, we returned to Anchorage to file our claim at the land office. Later, Joe went back and built a small cabin which would be our home for over a year while he built the log house and we called that the big house. Uh, the nearest all-weather road was five miles away, called the North Kenai Road. Years later, a loop road was built, which came along our land, so the Homestead Road, later called the Home Road. A lot of people called their roads the Home Road. A fourth of a mile long was built to join it. Now, I uh, wish I could read you more, but I've already gone for an hour, and... Um, uh, so I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope you'll sit down and write uh, your first memories and start writing a little book. I just published this on the web. I just um, I just went to a publisher and wrote my own, and uh, so that way you don't have to keep turning it. You don't have to be rejected. You just write what you want, it, and it prints it and sends it back to you, and then you order your own copies. So, um, so anyway, I hope you have a, a lovely. I hope you get a lot done. Just uh, Turn it off, start over, and start sweeping and start getting your house cleaned up and have a productive day. And uh, I will include some links when I get time, and I will talk to you later. Bye.